Thanks, Nina. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Steven, based in Brussels, Belgium. We have a lot of strikes in Belgium as well. Luckily, not this week. Um, I had the opportunity to work in digital for the past 18 years in a variety of different areas, commerce, PIM, um, and a big focus on data. And what I will do is I will share some of the, uh, the best practices, the, the things you should do to succeed in personalization at scale. But let's first do a quick introduction. If we can see the slides, thanks. Um, so as said in the introduction, I'm responsible for the go-to-market of our insights and activation practice, focusing on customer data, insights, and activation. Um, I'm representing Vimo, and Vimo is focusing on digital commerce, experience management, data management, and insights and activation. And we've been doing that for many brands. We have a, um, a global team, 650 people and growing, and uh, the company has been existing for 15 years. I'm going to keep this part short. If you want to learn more about us, we have a booth at the back, so feel free to come and uh, visit us. Uh, before I move on, I have a question for you guys. So I'm going to talk about personalization, but by raise of hands, who of you is already doing personalization for your consumers today? All right, I see some hands. Who of you is doing that fluently across all touch points already? I see some hesitating and, uh, yeah, which, which is normal, right? So it's, it's a big challenge. But still, it's very relevant because if you look today, consumers are expecting personalized experiences, right? Research shows that um, 71, the vast majority of the customers, do expect to um, <clears throat> have personalized interactions with a brand. And the vast majority of them, 76% of all consumers, are saying that they would uh, convert more and more likely uh, convert when they have personalized interactions with the brand. So from a customer point of view, it's very clear that there is a need for personalization. Secondly, from a company perspective, why would we do that? We see that the companies succeeding in personalization at scale, they are um, increasing their revenue with 10 to 15%. And the real leaders uh, in that area, the ones really uh, the best in class, are able to inc increase with 20, up to 25% um, their revenue. So it's very clear that from a client perspective, they're expecting it. And from a company perspective, there is a clear need and a clear demand of uh, personalizing the customer experience. Now, where do we need to invest in? Because there is a lot of different areas that should facilitate personalization at scale, so it's not always easy to find the right area to invest in. And what we should do is we should try to find what NASA calls the Goldilocks zone. When NASA is looking for other planets that potentially have life, they're looking for planets that are within a certain distance of their star, and that's what they call their Goldilocks zone. If we do investments as a company, uh, we can look at the hype cycle of Gartner. I guess uh, most of you will know that. And we need to find the best area where we can do our investments in. Let me guide you through this. So every new innovation, every new technology will go through this cycle. So in the beginning, there is a certain trigger for a technology. And in the beginning, expectations are very high. We are over expecting on what a technology could deliver. That's the very normal flow of things. And so we reach at some point a peak, the peak of inflated expectations. Soon after, we will see that this technology is not the holy grail that we thought it was. And we are going down, right? And we're going through the throw of disillusionment. So we are disappointment like it's not what, it, what we thought it was. And <clears throat> And uh, slightly, the use cases that are relevant, that are providing value, are um, taking us back up in the slope of enlightenment before we really reach the plateau of productivity where we get a certain level of maturity. This is reflecting how technology is adopted on the market, but you could also see the cycle within a big organization, how certain technology is adopted. And we need to try to squeeze down this, uh, this cycle, right? Because in the beginning, we risk over-investment, over-investing, investing too much in a certain technology too early. 
while big part of that investment will be wasted because of that, because we were too early. The effect is logic. We will, uh, at some point, disinvest certain technology and maybe stop using a certain technology, so that is for a big part waste of money. And at some point, we get use cases again, and then we might be reinvesting. So that is our Goldilocks zone. We need to try to find that uh, zone, right? Now, what does it mean for a company? And I'd like to show the example of Apple. Apple is today the biggest, the, high, the tech company with the highest value, right? But it wasn't always like that. And co-founder Steve Jobs founded the company, but left after some time. And then 10 years later, roughly, he came back. And when he came back, Apple was in a very bad position. So we had to take uh, very difficult decisions. One of the things that he did was he stopped the investments in uh, a software framework, OpenDoc, that Apple was working on. And during a big conference, a worldwide uh, developer conference, he got a lot of pushback. He was even insulted by somebody that was asking a question in that uh, conference. And he said, and that person said, look, you don't know what you were talking about, because we can do with OpenDoc many things that others cannot do. So what are you doing? And that was a surprise for everybody there, so we had to take a moment before reacting. And when he reacted, he said, yeah, you can only please some people some at the time. And, and in fact, this gentleman was right in some areas. Yes, probably there's a lot of things that this technology can do, even a lot of things that I'm not aware of. But the thing is, you need to um, identify, like, can we turn this technology into eight to 10 billion US dollars worth of product sales a year, which was not the case for him. So that's the reason why he stopped investment, investing. The main thing is that he then said was, you got to start from the customer experience and work backwards to technology. And this is very true. I've seen this all the time in the past 18 years. Often companies invest in the latest, biggest suite and, uh, or fancy technology, and then the results are not there. It's always the same thing. We should start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. Now, how do we do that? Of course, I guess none of us have the ambition to sell 8 to 10 billion worth of product a year. Um, at least I'm not. So we need to start with clarifying what is our mission. What is in our company, the mission, the vision we have, the mission behind, and the objectives we put to achieve that. That's step number one. Then we need to identify, if you have an existing customer base, who is our customer today, and what is the customer we are targeting. So identify customer profiles, also identify the key journey that the customer goes through, and identify the, the pains and the gains that the customer has in that journey. From there, we can start defining use cases. And use cases um, reflect certain capabilities that we need to achieve that, right? So we start from the customer, we identify use cases, and when we know which use cases we want to implement, we can know which capabilities we need. And that will then result in, okay, we need a certain technology, a certain tool, and you can define your architecture and your solution design um, of tools that you need to make that happen. So you start from a strategic point of view and you work your way, way down uh, to, be, to the operational side. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to deep dive a little bit in a few key areas that are very common uh, and needed to uh, achieve uh, with personalization at scale. The first one, very obvious, but a challenge for a lot of companies, for most, if not all companies, to have a single view of the customer. The customer nowadays has, in average, eight connected devices. That's based on research publicly online. In certain regions, it's even higher. So this is, um, let's say, a global average. At least in the Western world, global average. Um, so we are more and more connected than ever. And we also see that in a company, the company has to leverage 16 different sources to leverage customer data. So it can be your marketing automation tool, CRM, uh, web personalization tool, whatever it is, you have many, many different data sources where customer data is located. 
And if you want to get insights and engagements from, uh, and, and with that customer, it even goes up to 25. Again, these are averages. We also work for a lot of very big organizations, and then it even goes into the hundreds of data sources. So the point is, if you would need to build connections between all of these, between data sources, between activation channels or destination channels, that becomes a very expensive uh, thing, and it becomes mission impossible, because build all these integrations, maintaining all these integrations, having the right data at the right moment uh, to be able to personalize, it's impossible, because not all connections will facilitate you to have that in real time when you need it, right? So what we need is we need to have a single view of the customer. We need to have a solution that enables us to stitch together known data with different identifiers, such as uh, email or a customer ID and so on, but also unidentified, uh, unknown data like behavioral events and so on that can be at some point stitched together to the same customer profile, device ID, advertising ID, and so on, or other examples uh, there. So that's step, step number one. We need a solution that is stitching all these different profiles and these different tools, in fact, together to one uh, profile of a consumer. That solution needs to facilitate real time because we need to have certain triggers available in real time. Not all of them, probably, but the tool needs to facilitate that. And it needs to work with multiple identities. You need to have a certain governance in there that you make sure that the data is only used where uh, you're allowed to use it from a compliance and a legal perspective. Um, you need to have a unified data model, also allowing you to later in the stage have more advanced use cases on machine learning and potentially AI. Um, and of course, segmentation is a key fundamental to really um, yeah, use that data in destination channels. For example, I want to uh, do an advertising campaign and I want to exclude customers that already bought a certain product. Uh, use cases like that, you need to be able to segment data and then activate in the different destination channels. Advertising is just one. Uh, digital owned channels like personalization on the website is another. You don't want to promote a product if you know that through the loyalty card, the person already bought it in the physical shop. So these things need to be connected in the customer profile. Um, also customer systems, your emails, your WhatsApp, SMS messages, whatever you want to do to, communi to, to communicate with the customer needs to be uh, accessed, uh, uh, needs to have access to that data, right? It needs to use the same customer profile to be consistent in your messaging to the end consumer. So that's the first one, single view of customer. The second one is single view of product. So I'm going to give you a simulation, but um, more and more content is needed when we talk about personalization, right? Because we are all active on multiple different devices in a different context. Um, depending on the organization that you work for, you might have many products. Um, but the number of experiences is growing. Imagine this scenario. 1,000 products. I know a lot of you might have much more. Maybe if you work for a bank, it can be a very big bank, only having 30 or 50 products, right? But just follow along. 1,000 products. At that moment, you have um, 1,000 items. If you have 25 assets, like different images, if you have videos, a document, you have 25,000 assets. If you do that in multiple regions, it easily grows up, right? If you do that for thousands of customers, this goes into the millions. So if you do the simulation with many more products and maybe less customers or in less regions, the message is the same, right? You end up with millions and millions, maybe even billions of asset variations. So single view of product is the second one that I really want to address. This is not something new, and in fact, this already has a certain level of maturity, but still, it is a challenge today for a lot of uh, organizations, and it's a really um, a, a fundamental thing you need to have to do personalization at scale. Important to know as well, if you have the right technology in place, it's not that we build experiences and then the great experience is there. No, this is a process to go through. So experiences, great experiences are not created, they are crafted. You have to build 
learn, decide what the next step is, improve, and so on. You have to do this in a cyclic way. So the point is, I talked about purpose, like what is your mission, objectives, and so on. You also need to have the right KPIs in place to know if we are performing. Uh, you need to have the right platform, but you also need to have processes and people, because in the end, experiences are still built by processes and people, right? And in the past 18 years, I've seen that the ones that really succeed are the companies that succeed in growing gradually on all of these five areas. So what I would recommend you to do is, if you want to go through a certain transformation to work more data-driven, to do personalization at scale, is identify, uh, remember the slide with vision, objectives, the customer, the journey, the use cases, Define with capability mapping where you're at today on these five areas and define the actions that you need to take moving forward on each of these five, not only technology. And that is when you can make a roadmap which is um, achievable for an organization to take in to really move forward and succeed. So that's, that's what I said. Important to know as well is that uh, when you have people and processes in a company, it's also important that you have the right culture. Whatever you do in something that you want to achieve in a team is that you do this together in a team, but you, that you also accept the fact that there can be failure. I always say your objectives can be fixed. For example, objectives of the year. Uh, usually you say, okay, this is what we go for. But the way to get there should be flexible. People should be able to innovate, experiment, uh, to try something new, even if they fail sometimes. If you don't allow that in an organization, then you will not succeed. Then everybody tries to play safe, and that's not what you want, if you want to succeed. So the thing is, in order to succeed, your desire for success should be greater than your fear of failure. And that's my last recommendation that I wanted to give. So highlights of uh, the key takeaways that I want to give you is um, define your success, define your purpose, dream big, but start small with smaller use cases. Start from the customer, uh, from the customer experience and work backwards to technology. Try to focus your investments in your optimal Goldilocks zone. Two key areas to really focus on, that is for the majority, uh, is make sure that you have a single view on the, of the customer and a single view of product, and then you already have a good foundation. And remember that great experiences are not simply built, they are crafted by people through iterative processes. Last thing, I already told you that we are present with a boot at the back. Uh, you can uh, win um, Apple AirPods if you participate in a very small survey that we have. So don't hesitate to visit us there or scan the QR code right now to do that. Thank you for your attention. That was my presentation. Thank you so much, Steve. So many interesting stuff. And uh, like you said, you were talking about this hype cycle and uh, that we should invest our Goldilocks zone. Was it right? Yeah. Yes. Um, what would you say, what are the main technology areas that are expected to provide the biggest value yeah. if we think about the near future? Yeah, if we look overall on the market, because again, this is very individual for one organization to the other, but overall in the market, remember the hype cycle, um, the technology really coming up again, meaning providing value, expected value in the coming few years is uh, technologies like CDP. Uh, the example I gave, single view of customer, I see most of you uh, are, some of you are experimenting with personalization, but I'm pretty sure that most of you have a focus on it, but there is work to do, and this is one of the key enabling technologies on that. Mm -hmm. To give another example, AI was very high at the peak of inflation, uh, the, the peak of inflected expectations, but they went very fast through it. So there we also implement use cases, uh, but it means that you need to keep your investment smaller to innovate there, right? Yeah. So that's one, yeah. Yeah, and the second question, just shortly, uh, the headline of your speech was future-proof digital commerce. 
Because the world is changing so rapidly, do you actually believe there is such a thing as future proof? Ha. That's <laughs> a good point because we often overestimate what will happen in mm. two years, but underestimate what happens in 10 yeah. years, right? So we never know that for sure. We only can look at uh, the trends that we see. We can see at uh, start from the customer, looking at what the customer needs and try to build up from there. And again, you might fail on that journey now and then, but you need to try to make, uh, to keep your failures light and learn from it. And, and the waste investment, try to keep that light. That's the challenge we have, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Steven, thank you so much for sharing all this. Thank you. Welcome.